There was a first grade teacher, and along with her 32 first grade students, she watched it rain all day long. But finally, that last bell sounded. It was time to go home. And so she helped every one of those students put on their galoshes. Finally, beads of sweat on her forehead, she got to the last little girl. For some reason, her galoshes were especially tight. And so this was a big job. She tugged, she pulled, she grunted, she groaned, she struggled, she strained, finally got those galoshes on, snapped the last catch, and the little girl said, Teacher, did you know that these are not my galoshes? (laughs) So she unsnapped the buckles, struggled, strained, grunted, groaned, pulled, tugged, got them off, and the little girl said, no, they belong to my sister, and she just let me wear them today. (laughs) The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience. And I'll guarantee you, as you go through this life, you're going to need patience, and you're going to need a lot of it. You're going to get into situations that are so frustrating just like that poor teacher. And you need to have the kind of endurance, the kind of patience to get through. Now, there are several words in the New Testament that are translated patience. One of them is the word hupomone, and it's a very colorful word. It was used to describe a plant that could grow in unfavorable and adverse conditions. You've seen plants like that, haven't you? Why is it that flowers take such attention and care to grow, but a weed can survive anywhere? You can do everything you possibly can to get rid of that weed, but it's going to keep coming back. It survives under the worst of conditions. That's your word, hupomone. And it's a word that describes patience, endurance in difficult circumstances. And this kind of endurance or patience is an indication of faith. It it refers to the kind of attitude that understands that God is in control and that he is bigger than our problems. And no matter what happens, God can take that difficulty and he can use it for our good and for our blessing. And so understanding that, we just endure. We have that patience, that steadfastness, and that, that's the way it's translated quite often uh, in many versions of the New Testament. It's the kind of endurance that Joseph had, remember, Uh, betrayed by his brothers, thrown into that pit, sold into bondage, wound up in Potiphar's house, falsely accused, one thing after another. And at the end, when he's finally reconciled with his brothers, he says, you know, you meant it to me for evil, but God meant it for good. That's hupomone, that is patience. And, And the Bible is a book of waiting. Did you know that? of people who had the patience to endure, the patience to wait, like Moses, like Abraham, like David, a book of waiting. And you know, sometimes waiting is hard when we're in a hurry and God isn't. And so we want that prayer to be answered and we want it to be answered uh, immediately. God says, wait a little while. Or when we want our financial situation to get better right away. And in God's timetable, it's a little bit farther down the road. Or there's an illness that we have or a problem that we face, but our timetable is different from God. We are not ready to wait. We are in more of a hurry than God is. But what we need to remember is that God is never late. God is always on time. 
And so remember in John chapter 11, when Lazarus was ill and his sisters sent to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And Jesus waited two days to come. And the sisters were heartbroken. Lord, if you'd only been here, our brother had not died. But the Lord's delay turned out to be the Lord's blessing because he restored the life of Lazarus and caused faith in the hearts of many people to grow. Endurance under difficult circumstances When the situations are tough, hupomone. But there is another word, and it's the word that is used in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and some of you have the word long-suffering. Love, joy, peace, and long-suffering. And that's because this is the word macrothumia. Macro means long or slow. And thumia, uh, we have the word thermal or thermos. It's the idea of heat. Slow to heat up. Slow to get angry. That's the idea in the word here. We have uh, someone that we refer to as having a short fuse. This is the guy that has the long fuse. He's able, as one person said, to idle his motor without stripping his gears. It's the idea of a person who is slow to get angry, and when he does get angry, he's quick to get over it. A lot of people are the opposite, quick to get angry and slow to get over it. This is a a word that refers to someone who, no matter what he endures, what he has to put up with, He is slow to get upset and he never harbors resentment or the desire to get revenge. And it is a word that is used most often to refer to patience, not with circumstances, but to patience with people. And that's the way it's used here. Long-suffering or patience. And quite frankly, in the world of the first century, this was not looked upon as a virtue. It was Aristotle who said that one of the great virtues of the Greek people was that they would not tolerate, they refused to tolerate any insult or injury and that they were determined to retaliate in kind. They regarded that as a virtue. And we do today too to a great extent, don't we? You know, who do we admire? Who are our heroes in the movies? That guy that won't take anything from anybody. And he'll give back what he receives double pay. That's the kind of character we admire in our country. But the child of God is not like that. He is patient with people. He doesn't harbor grudges. He is slow to get angry, and when he does, he gets over it, and he deals with it. He is patient with people. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning and possibly next week. But what we're gonna, we want to begin with is the, the, the challenges to patience. You know, this life is not conducive to patience, really, when you stop and think about it. There are so many things that push our buttons. And that's true because life is not just perfectly predictable. Things don't always go the way that we want them to go and people don't always treat us the way that we think they should. So what are some of those things that challenge our patience? Well, I think the first thing is interruptions. Nobody Nobody likes to be interrupted, do they? I mean, here you are, it's dinner time, you've gotten the family around the table, it's a good meal, you sit down to eat, and all of a sudden, the phone rings. And the recorded voice on the other end of the line tells you 
that the extended warranty on your 19-year-old car is about to expire. Or you're, you're working on something, a project, and you've got a deadline and company stops by and they just stay and they stay and they stay. You may be like the fellow that had company at night and they uh, you know, just stayed so long. Finally, he got up and he said, you know, I'm going to go to bed so you can go home. But interruptions, we don't like interruptions. And we don't like interruptions because we, we somehow think that our business is more important than anybody else's business. But life is a series of interruptions. And there's some things that we can learn from interruptions. You think about Jesus. His life, his ministry was one interruption after another. You know, I think about that time in Matthew chapter 19 where Jesus was with the disciples and, and the parents brought their children to Jesus and they wanted him to put his hands on them and to pray for them. And, and the disciples rebuked those parents. Don't you know? I mean, you know, here is our master. He's too busy to deal with this. And Jesus said, oh, no. You allow the little children to come unto me. And he prayed over them. He blessed them and sent them away. Or there was that time when uh, uh, Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, came to Jesus. And, and his little girl was ill. She was at the point of death. Lord, you need to come with me. And so Jesus was on his way, and a woman in the crowd, remember, that had that issue of blood for 12 years, nobody could heal, came up and touched the hem of his garment. And Jesus stopped, and he dealt with that, an interruption. And then there was that time when, when Jesus was teaching, and a man out of the crowd interrupted and he said, Lord, bid my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Whatever Jesus was doing, he was always interrupted when he tried to get away with his disciples and, and rest and, and get some refreshment. The crowds followed him there. But let me tell you how Jesus dealt with interruptions. He regarded them as opportunities. And so here he was resting beside a well while his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food and a woman comes up out of the city. And Jesus used that interruption as an opportunity to teach. Jesus never wasted an interruption. Jesus always used an interruption as an opportunity to accomplish something worthwhile. And if, if you are really involved in God's service and interested about spiritual things, God is going to see to it that you're interrupted. I really believe that. You know, somebody has said that God only uses busy people. There are very few times when, when God would go uh, and, and uh, call someone who had no interest in spiritual things, who was doing nothing in the kingdom of God. But he used people, and some of God's greatest blessings have come as a result of interruptions. So here is Elisha, and he's plowing in his field, and Elijah comes up to him, throws his mantle over him, interrupts his calm and peaceful life, and commissions him to be a prophet of God. Or here is Abram, and he's got a good and a comfortable life in Ur, and God interrupts him and says, Abraham, Abram, I want you to leave your home, your family, your kindred, go to a land that I will show you. Moses, it's time to stop tending those sheep in the wilderness of Midian. And he interrupted Moses in that tranquil life. But those interruptions turned out to be great blessings. And when we are kind of irritated by an interruption, maybe we need to lift our heads and say, is there something that God is calling my attention to? What are the opportunities in this interruption. And then there are inconveniences. Nobody, nobody likes to be inconvenienced, do they? And that's because, you know, we just sort of think that life ought to be easy, but life isn't always easy. 
And sometimes it's inconvenient. To, and and uh, Americans, they took a survey, and Americans says the thing that disturbs them the most is inconveniences. When, when we feel like somebody else is not pulling their share of the load, when we're just overwhelmed and we're put on. Luke chapter 10. Remember Mary and Martha? Jesus and the disciples were a guest in their home. And Mary was in the other room with Jesus sitting at his feet listening to him teach. Martha was trying to prepare a meal. And quite frankly, she got a little bit impatient. And so she went into the other room. She was just overwhelmed with preparing that meal. Lord, don't, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bitter, therefore, that she come and help me. You remember what Jesus said? Martha, Martha. You're anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Mary hath chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. She was impatient because she felt like the load had fallen on her. It was inconvenient for her to have to do everything. But you know, sometimes we need to be reminded. You see, it's, it's easy for us to get so focused on our priorities that we need to lift our heads and look around and realize that there are other priorities and maybe we're missing the best in life. That's what happened to Martha. The Lord said, Martha, listen, it's not a bad thing to prepare a meal, but there's something even better and you're missing out on the better things of life. But inconveniences kind of work on our patience a little bit. We ought to realize, though, it's an opportunity to look up and to see the big picture. And then irritations. Irritations. There are some people that just know how to push our buttons, aren't there? They just get under our skin. They... Uh, they just do things and say things that irritate us. And if we're not careful, they'll wind up in somehow our doing wrong. Let me give you an example of that. Moses. Moses put up with so much from the people of Israel. I mean, if they weren't complaining about one thing or another, they were complaining about Moses. Moses, we don't have water. Moses, we don't have food. Moses, we need this. Moses, we need that. We want meat. We're tired of this manna. And they always pointed the finger, not just at God, but at Moses. And Moses, on one occasion, just really had had all that he thought he could take. He got irritated and impatient. And remember what he did? God said, speak to the rock. Moses struck the rock and he said, must we bring forth water for you rebels? And as a result of that, God said, Moses, you're not going into the promised land. It was his impatience. Listen, if you will to a passage in, in the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 37 and, and beginning in verse 7. Now, in the context of this psalm, the psalmist is talking about fretting, getting upset because the wicked seem to prosper. And, and it just irritates the psalmist to look around and see Good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. And so he begins by saying, don't fret yourself because of evildoers. But then in verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself because of him that prospereth in the way, because of the man who bringeth forth wicked devices to pass. Cease 
from anger. Okay? Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself, it tendeth only to evil doing. Does that sound familiar? Cease from anger. It tends only to evil doing. That's what happened to Moses because of his impatience. Those irritations sometimes lead us to react in the wrong way. And so he goes on to say, evildoers will be cut off, but those that wait for Jehovah shall inherit the land. God's going to take care of it. And God's going to bless you if you'll just be patient. But not only that, there's inactivity. It's hard for us to wait, isn't it? Have you ever seen the guy at the elevator and he pushes the button, he waits a couple of seconds, he pushes it again. And he pushes it again and then he just gives it this. It's hard for us to wait. It's hard for us to wait at the stoplight. You know, but did you realize that the average person will spend six months of his life waiting at traffic lights? But we don't like to wait, and we become impatient when we have to wait. But what we need to remember is that waiting time is not necessarily wasted time. You think about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul sent a, spent a great deal of his life just waiting. Uh, when he was driven from Thessalonica, and he, he had to go down to Athens. Some of the brethren escorted him down there. And, and then they left. And he was waiting for Timothy and Silas to come. Waiting, waiting by himself. You know what he did while he was waiting? He preached one of the greatest of all the sermons that he ever preached which is recorded for us in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. His spirit was provoked within him when he saw the, the city filled with idols. He was waiting, but he wasn't wasting his time. And then he was working in Ephesus, but he had sent Titus over to, to Corinth. And he was anxious to hear word from uh, uh, Titus about how things were going Corinth. Titus didn't come. So he left Ephesus and he went up to Troas to meet him and he was waiting. But you know what he did while he was waiting? He preached and he made converts. Then he was in prison in Rome for two years. Waiting, waiting, waiting. But he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. And he preached so that the gospel was spread throughout the whole Praetorian guard. And then toward the end of the book, he mentions the fact that there were saints in Caesar's household waiting, waiting, but not wasting. And in those moments when we have to wait, we can use our time productively. Those are the challenges, the challenges to patience. But let's see how far we can get in cultivating patience. And so we'll, we'll go as far as we can. Number one, number one, don't overreact. We do that a lot of time. David did. Remember 1 Samuel 25 when he was dealing with a fellow named Nabal? David and his men had, had helped him. He had, they had served as kind of an informal police force and protected his flocks and his herdsmen from marauders and wild animals. And when harvest or, or uh, shearing time came, David asked for a little consideration. It wasn't a demand. It was just a polite request. And Nabal was curlish and rude and disrespectful in his answer. And he referred to David as a runaway slave and his men as people who came from who knows where. And David responded. In a way, it was all out of proportion to what had happened. 
And so he got 400 of his men. He said, strap on your swords and God deal with me severely if by this time tomorrow there's one person of Nabal's left alive. Now, I know he'd been insulted, but friends, listen, that was way out of proportion. That was responding, that was killing a mosquito with a cannon. And in the heat of the moment, you know, there's never been an angry man who in the, the heat of his anger didn't feel like his anger was justified. But David was in jeopardy of becoming an even greater fool than the fool he was dealing with. And it was Abigail that talked to him and said, now listen, David. One of these days, God's going to put you on the throne. And don't you do anything at all that later you'll regret and you'll have to live with the guilt of blood on your hands. Pretty good advice. And so when you become impatient, don't blow it out of proportion. Step back and look at it. Put it in perspective and don't respond in a way that you'll later regret. Number two, be consistent. Be just as patient with others as you expect them to be with you. You know, the degree of patience that you have often is determined by where you are in the line of traffic. If, if you're sitting at a stoplight and you're the first car and the light turns green and you delay a couple of seconds and the guy behind you pushes on the horn and you think, where's the fire? What's wrong? Give me a second. If you're the second car and the light turns green and he delays a couple of seconds, what do you do? What are you waiting for? Let's move on. You see, it all depends on perspective, doesn't it? Sometimes we have less patience with others than we expect others to have patience with us. But you treat the other guy. You be as understanding of the other guy as you expect him to be understanding of you. That's what God expects. Remember Matthew 18, the parable of the unforgiving servant. He owed his master a great debt. The master brought him in and the fellow pleaded, just have patience with me and I'll pay you all. And he received that patience from his master. But then he goes out and here's a, a, another servant that owes him just a, a little bit of money. And that servant says, just have patience with me. And this guy that received patience refused and had him uh, arrested and thrown in prison. You can see the injustice in that. Be consistent. You be as patient with others as you expect them to be with you. Be forbearing. All right? Ephesians 4 and verse 2. Be long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. I like the way the Living Bible puts it. It says, you be patient with each other Bearing with each other's failures or putting up with each other's failures because of your love for one another. That's what it means to be forbearing. It means to put up with the failures of others, tolerating the mistakes and the failures of others in a good natured way. Now, it doesn't mean that you, you know, turn a blind eye to sin or you put up with error. But he's talking about those things that irritate us, those unintended slights, so many things that we ought to just put up with, forget about it, and move on. Not everything rises to the level of a forgivable matter. There's a difference between forgiving and forbearing. Not every wound requires stitches. And not every irritation requires forgiveness. There, we ought to be big enough people that sometimes we can just move on. Remember in Proverbs, the writer says, 
It is wisdom that causes a man to be patient, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Sometimes a person unintentionally says something that he doesn't even read. Just move on. Move on. Sometimes he's had a bad day and says something. Just move on. Move on. Be forbearing. Be forgetful. Okay? In describing love in 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says that love thinketh no evil. Some of you have the translation there, keeps no record of wrongs. And that's really what the word meant. It was an accounting term that uh, referred to entering something in a ledger. You enter something in a ledger so that you can keep a record of it and remember it. Love doesn't act that way. Love doesn't keep a scrapbook of record of wrongs that it's received. Love and patience have a way of forgetting and moving on past. It doesn't keep dwelling on it, going over it, repeating it, retelling it. All that does is contribute to bitterness. I like the way that Dwight Eisenhower, the 34th president, did. He said if there was someone who had offended him, someone who had uh, said something that got on his nerves, he'd write it on a piece of paper, put the man's name on it, crumple it up, put it in his desk drawer, and as far as he was concerned, that was the end of it. Be forgetful. Love people. Love, remember 1 Corinthians 13, love is what? Patient. Love is patient. Now, guys, your wife is a whole lot more patient with you than the credit card company, isn't she? She cuts you a lot more slack than the bill collector. Why? Because she has a different relationship with you than they do. She loves you. And because she loves you, she's willing to be patient with you. And the more we love people, the more patient we can become. Believe the best. Again, talking about love, he says that love believes all things, hopes all things. You can be patient with a person if you really believe in that person. If you are convinced that they may not be what they ought to be, but they're not all that they're going to be, you give them the benefit of the doubt until there's no benefit in the doubt. You think the best in terms of their motives. Look at Jesus. Jesus chose a band of disciples. One of those guys was Simon Peter. Simon Peter did a lot of irritating stuff. You know, let me wash your feet. Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Peter, you've messed up the point I'm trying to make. Uh, they're going to take me and I will be crucified. This is an intense moment. Now, Lord, may that never be so. Get thee behind me, Satan. Where I'm going, you cannot. Lord, why can't we go while you're coming? Peter was always, you know, but the Lord was so patient with Peter. Why? Because back at the very beginning, he realized, here's a guy that's got a good heart. And he changed his name from Simon to Peter, the rock. Not because he was a rock then, but because the Lord believed in him. Believes all things. Hopes all things. All right? And in addition to that, be understanding. Be understanding. You know, part of impatience 
is selfishness. We, we look at things from our point of view. We think our point of view is the only point of view. And this is what I want. And this is what is important. And, and we totally lose sight of the other person's perspective. But the Bible teaches that we can be patient as we understand others. And so in Romans 14 and 15, Paul is talking about the relationship between the strong brother and the weak brother. And he says, you that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Put up with them. Be patient with them. And don't judge one another. And, don't, and why? Paul says, because that weak brother does what he does out of love and respect for the Lord. You may not agree with him, but put yourself in his shoes and, and, and see from his perspective. Understand. And we need to do a lot of that too. You know, that person that calls on the phone and tries to sell you something, it's irritating. That might be the only way he has to feed his family. And that person that's not interested in exactly what you're interested in may have different needs or priorities at that point in his life. Understand. Well, you know, when, when the people of Israel took the land of Canaan, they almost had a civil war before they could all go back home. Because the two and a half tribes that had settled on the east side of the Jordan, when they got to the Jordan, before they crossed, uh, they made a, a, a monument there and built an altar there. And the other tribes saw that and they got all upset and they said, we're going to war because they're bringing idolatry into the land. And so they, they sent a delegation over there and said, get ready, we're coming after you. And they said, wait a minute. We're just doing this so that in generations to come, our children will see it and they'll ask, what is this about? And we can tell them, we're part of those guys over there on the other side of the Jordan. And it'll be a, a, a memorial to the fact that we are one people, you know, and that we worship this God. And, and, and so they saw it from their perspective. And so those are some of the 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 ways in which we cultivate patience. And you know, the greatest example of long-suffering in the Bible is God himself. That word long-suffering is used to refer to him over and over again. 1 Peter chapter uh, 3, you remember? It talks about the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. When God determined to destroy the earth, he gave him 120 years to repent. Why? Because of his long suffering, his patience. And first Peter chapter, or second Peter chapter three, why is it that, that judgment hasn't come already? It's because God is long suffering to us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Oh, folks, God is so patient. And to turn away from his love in Romans chapter 2, Paul says that if you do that, you despise the goodness and the long-suffering and the forbearance of God. Don't treat his patience with contempt. Your only hope is that God is patient and long-suffering. And oh, he has been. And every day that you live and every breath that you take is the long-suffering, the patience of God contributing to your salvation. Do you need to experience that patience this morning? If you do, we want to encourage you to act, not to treat the long-suffering of God with contempt, but to respond in obedience to His Word, believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, and being immersed in the waters of baptism. And God will forgive and wash those sins away. And if you've wandered away from Him, God is so patient that He'll let you come back if you'll repent and, and pray for His forgiveness. Do you need to do that? If you do, do it now while together we stand and as we sing.